I want to start with the whole Melchizedek thing, just to get it out of the way, because it's like, what? <laughs> so Melchizedek, the, the scholars in researching the Hebrews text seem to be a little bit like, sure, why not Melchizedek? So Melchizedek is a thing. So Melchizedek was the king priest of a town, a city called Salem. Salem is a Semitic word that's related to the word shalom, which we know means peace, but it also means perhaps more fully wholeness, being whole, peace and wholeness. So this, this city at the peak of the coastal mountain range there on the eastern side of the Mediterranean was named Salem. And this goes way, way back where the priest, Melchizedek, the priest king, came out to bless Abram. So this is before Abram had a whole name, like Abraham. And this is before Salem had a whole name, like Jerusalem is the name of that city as we understand it today. So we begin to see this, this uh, the academic term is cultic association with the city of Jerusalem and the worship of God even prior to Abram, and we get this curious piece. So the, the author of Hebrews is reaching way, way back, pre-Levitical understanding of the priesthood, because as we remember from the Old Testament, the priests all come from the tribe of Levi. So this goes way back prior to that, a sense that God and the priesthood of Christ goes all the way back is perhaps the point of the Hebrews text. I'm sure that answered all of your questions. I'm just going to put a pin in that and move on to the rest of the text. <laughs> One of the things that I think of when we look at the gospel text for today in this idea of service, a little bit at a right angle to Elizabeth's uh, children's sermon here, I, I have a sense of how the Greek maybe would be translated differently when James and John come forward and say, give us anything we want. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, maybe the Greek underneath actually says, sit down clowns, or I'm sorry, who are you? Um, this sense of trying to get the inside track on what's going on with Jesus and trying to get ahead, ahead of the other disciples. Because there's a reference towards the end of this that we don't get often. We will hear about the 12, right? The 12, the 12, the 12. But at the end of this text, we hear about the 10. Now the group has been splintered. There are the two who were seeking to get ahead. And then there are the 10 who are angry at them because they didn't think of it first, right? Because they didn't think of it first. As human beings, this idea of a universe of scarcity, where there are the ones who come first, and then there are those who lose, right? There are winners, and there are losers. One of our big angsts as human beings is if somebody were to cut in line in front of us, right? That can be literal or it can be metaphorical for anything. And we get, that's something that gets under our skin as human beings almost more than anything. It's the idea that someone has cut ahead of us. These are human ideas. Just like when you watch a movie, the victor is the one who wins at the end. The one who vanquishes the foe perhaps very literally, maybe even kills in victory. Where is our gospel of Mark headed? To a cross on a hill outside of Jerusalem. Victory. Victory. But that's not our human sense, is it? A cross outside of Jerusalem is the human definition of failure and defeat. By definition, in Jesus Christ, everything about our human order 
is turned upside down. We see Jesus relate to and lift up women and others at the margins of society that in human systems are cast aside and put down. We see victory in death. We also see service by leaders. I will never forget when I was a young pastor in Minnesota, about a month after I began my ministry up in Alexandria, our son, our first child, was born and was immediately driven by ambulance to St. Cloud and flown to Minneapolis Children's Hospital where a very severe congenital heart defect was identified. He had his first of now seven surgeries at eight days of age. And usually the routine after the first one was we would go down for a heart catheterization when the cardiologist had some sense that there was surgery probably on the somewhat near horizon. So we would drive the two hours down, sit in the waiting room through this procedure, and then the cardiologist would come out and say, you know, this is what we're seeing, the things we've been watching, and in about three or four months, we want to get him on the calendar for surgery. But one time, we went down on a Tuesday for a heart cath, and they came out of the cath lab and said, how does Thursday sound? Things were different. The cardiologist saw more progression than had been anticipated, and it was time to do something much sooner than had been planned. And as you can imagine, that was hugely nerve-wracking. We did not have change of clothes. We didn't have anything for this suddenly now extended stay in the Twin Cities. And we didn't have a pastor because I was the pastor, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I guess I was visiting myself continuously, but that wasn't quite the thing. But that Thursday morning very early, the social worker on that floor by the name of Ione Hansen had mentioned to her husband, who was a Lutheran pastor, Mark Hansen, that there was a young pastor and family in the hospital and that he should visit them even though he had no relationship to me. Some of you perhaps know that name, Mark Hansen. He was our presiding bishop up until a few years ago. At the time, he was the bishop of the St. Paul Area Synod. He was not my bishop, but he was local, and he knew that there was a need to serve, and so he came. What is striking to me, not so much that visit, as cool as that was, but was several years later, when I went to a national youth gathering with 40,000 people, and I happened to bump into him. He was now the presiding bishop, and he said, Matt, Matt Smuts, you're at Shalom in Alexandria, aren't you? <laughs> How many hospital visits does he make? Hundreds, hundreds, but he knew my name. On a small level, this idea of service is a basic and initial orientation outside of ourselves, as opposed to inside of ourselves. I have become quite addicted, and I think Pastor Friederica has had about enough of it at this point, but to the new show, Ted Lasso. And one of the things in the first episode or two that is particularly striking about this character is that he learns everyone's names from the groundkeepers to the person who mows the field, all of these things. And what's interesting is the narrative about how odd that is in the story, that we know other people's names, particularly people that are perhaps below us, that we take time to orient ourselves outwards in service towards others. The other thing that's interesting to me in this text is that the people who are going and asking Jesus about being first and having privilege are people who then, Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say, sure, yeah, we can do that. 
Now, if you're reading this for the first time, you're going, oh man, no, what are you guys talking about? You have no idea what you're talking about. And so the next part of the text should go like this, right? Where Jesus says, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. No, you have no ability to do these things. But Jesus says, yeah, actually, no, you're right. (laughs) You will drink the cup that I drink. You will be baptized. Now, it's interesting on a couple of levels because the cup that I drink is an ominous, heavy cloud kind of reference. This is a reference to the walk that Jesus takes from Jerusalem to a hill outside of it. Yes, you will drink the cup that I drink. And the baptism with which I have been baptized. The idea that we have been named and marked for service in this world. An orientation towards others. Towards others. One of my small pet peeves in this life, I know none of you have any of these, but one of the small things that has bothered me as a cyclist in particular, but as a driver as well, is the universal abandonment of the use of turn signals. The idea that there is no one around me that needs my assistance in navigating. (laughs) Complete, (laughs) curved in on oneself. The idea that even in that small way, we might serve others, that they might know the way safely home. There is a trick, because as human beings, when we get up in the morning, we're not as concerned about someone else's breakfast as we are about our own, or lunch, or dinner. Part of joining together in a community is that we have this touch point on a weekly basis to turn ourselves out. Think about that. Most of society that does not have this kind of touch point is not being grounded or anchored in a way that turns them out on a regular basis. This is part of our discipline in coming together because we know as human beings that's not our natural predisposition. But we stop and we take a minute and we say, that's right, we are to be oriented out. I need to think better this week about how I might do that. As we gather in this place, as we remember this, as Elizabeth gathered with the children at the font, I want to leave you now with just some of the older words that we would say at the end of the baptismal rite when we would welcome in a newborn often, but not always, into the body of Christ. We welcome you as a fellow worker with us in the kingdom of God. That the baptized life is a life of service towards others. And that in doing that, we are subverting the way of this world. And in doing this, we draw closer to Christ. Amen.